Thank you for joining us tonight as we present Biotoxins and Toxicology with Chairperson of the Fellowship of Metabolic and Nutritional Medicine, Dr. Andrew Heyman. Adverse toxin exposure can have a long-range health effects in human metabolism. Understanding the toxicology asso associated with these exposures and identifying laboratory methods of assessment is a crucial part of the knowledge base for an integrative physician practicing this medicine in a toxic world. Dr. Andrew Heyman is an internationally recognized expert in integrative medicine. He is currently the program director of integrative and metabolic medicine at the George Washington University. Prior to assuming this role, he spent 16 years at the University of Michigan, serving to build one of the largest and most successful academic-based integrative medicine programs in the United States. Due to the high attendance this evening, please use your chat button to submit questions, and we will address a few questions at the end of the webinar. Dr. Heyman, I'll turn the webinar over to you. Great. Thanks, Lindsay. Um, so th this is a difficult topic to tackle. And I think it's difficult because it's, it's complicated from a, a toxicology perspective. Um, and also there are uh, other, I think, influential factors uh, that come to play with regard to uh, this notion of toxicology. Um, and also from a professional perspective, I would say the field of um, medical toxicology is still pretty young with regard to um, sort of how we look at things, and, and that is to say that uh, an accumulation of, of uh, low-grade exposures over time matters in terms of physiology and, and chronic disease. Uh, that is not an idea that has been well accepted in the established sort of medical community, but it's growing, and it's growing in very interesting ways and even in surprising ways when you see uh, which research groups are doing the interesting work with regard to toxicology. When I think about this subject, though, I, I think about it through several different lenses. Um, the first, of course, is, you know, what are the toxins that humans are exposed to? Um, but I tend to broaden that net uh, and think about also um, uh, what, would, what I would call biotoxins, and that is to say uh, vectors such as infections as well as uh, organisms uh, such as mold. Uh, that also can generate, uh, you know, sort of a sickness complex in patients. And that, in fact, there's an overlap between the sorts of uh, biological exposures as well as um, chemical uh, and heavy metal uh, exposures in their sort of final common pathway in the way that they generate uh, chronic illness. And so I tend to put these two pieces together. When I have a patient who I think is toxic, uh, I often think about, well, what are the toxins they've been exposed to, but also what are the biotoxins that they've been exposed to. And for those of you who've heard uh, myself and Dr. Laval lecture, um, I think this is really modeled quite well through uh, looking at a triad two and four. Uh, triad two, which is uh, the gut immune brain axis, uh, tends to be, I think, the major set of biological systems through which these sorts of exposures express themselves, whether it's someone who has a heavy metal poisoning uh, or a chemical exposure uh, or they are living in a moldy environment or they have acquired some sort of tick-borne illness or stealth infection. Oftentimes the symptoms that patients express are in this particular uh, network. And this network is represented uh, in its characteristics in terms of being uh, kind of primary command and control. Uh, and what I mean by that is that on every level, uh, on the level of the gut in terms of decision making from moment to moment with regard to taking in and letting go, uh, in terms of the immune system that sits right on the other side, trying to determine what's getting across the gut lining uh, is a threat or not. Uh, in that sense of determining self or not self. And then finally, that kind of psychic barrier, the last thinking layer, which is the brain. And what's interesting is that um, not only do we have an entire second brain essentially in the gut, uh, but when you look at the total neural uh, um, impulse mass that is going from the gut to the brain, it tends to uh, be far greater 
from the impulses that are going from the brain to the gut. So it's the afferents versus the efferent, which is interesting that, in fact, uh, the gut is a major sensing unit for the central nervous system. Uh, so all of this information uh, is occurring uh, in the gut immune brain axis, uh, physically located in that gut immune uh, enteric nervous system uh, complex. And uh, when you look at the ways in which exposures uh, affect the body, a lot of that is filtered through this particular system. And so these are these major uh, uh, physiologic interfaces that talk to each other. Uh, they um, uh, keep us safe in the world nutritionally, immunologically, and psychically. And when that occurs, we have sort of that sense of being organized and secure, organized across all of those domains. Uh, we are replete. Uh, we are safe. Uh, we are making good decisions. And we are secure on all of those levels. Uh, but when there's sort of an overwhelming of these body systems, uh, when uh, the gut is breaking down, when the immune system is becoming inflamed, when we have neuroexcitotoxicity, uh, there's this sense of disorder and unpredictability. Uh, this can express itself, uh, for example, through irritable bowel syndrome, through the flares of an autoimmune patient, through the ups and downs of a depressed and anxious person. And we know there's a lot of overlap uh, in those sorts of categories. Sitting underneath of those systems, uh, symptoms and, chron and chronic illnesses are often sort of driving factors that create that imbalance and disorder and unpredictability. In my particular practice, when I have a patient who presents with uh, symptoms of uh, gut dysfunction and food sensitivities, uh, inflammation and achy joints and fatigue, as well as anxiety and depression and poor cognition, I automatically start looking for biological exposures as well as um, toxic exposures. So I, I wanted to talk a little bit about uh, this notion of chronic inflammatory response syndrome because I think it begins to encapsulate the ways in which these exposures begin to manifest themselves within gut immune brain in particular. So chronic inflammatory response is uh, the idea that the innate immune system in particular um, has been triggered or activated because of a biological threat. This is not the adaptive or acquired side of the immune system. This is not a T cell or B cell mediated response. This is that primal innate immune reaction to biological exposures where we have a very specific set of immune markers that are activated or expressed uh, through uh, the innate immune pathways. A lot of this is genetically mediated. We know that a certain portion of the uh, population has a predisposition to a triggering of the innate immune system that is pathological. And the pathology is that not only do we have an over-exuberant innate immune response, but that in fact these are individuals who can't shift the innate immune response to the adaptive or acquired. So we don't see B cell and T cell activation. So these patients can remain perpetually inflamed. And therefore they have a chronic set of symptoms that I'll, I'll review. Um, so there's a growing awareness then that these microbes or biological toxins play a major role in chronic illness, and that in fact terrain matters. The terrain of the psyche and how that affects the immune system, the terrain of the gut and whether or not uh, the individual has uh, dysbiosis or, or an intact uh, gut immune interface, uh, and that when the terrain is broken down because of toxins and infections and stress and poor diet and drugs, that's when we begin to see a major problem within gut immune brain in, in particular. So terrain matters uh, um, specifically in this kind of patient population. And it's not uncommon for a patient to present who's become very, very sick from, let's say, living in a moldy environment, but that when you start going through their medical history, they often have periods of uh, high stress or even emotional trauma that predates this sort of super sensitivity in a sense. We also know that chronic infections can alter or suppress the immune system. I think Lyme is a good model for this. Uh, and that other factors alter immunity. So the presence of metals and chemicals in particular change the way the immune system responds to these biological threats. We also know that biological threats, in fact, um, will uh, purposely harbor or sequester chemicals and heavy metals. Uh, and it's a, it's a survival mechanism to ensure that our own immune system becomes impaired in the presence of a higher mass of, let's say, mercury when there's a chronic infection or when there's a mold exposure. 
So these two things really go hand in hand in terms of when we look at toxicology, it's very important to look at the microbiology and terrain of the uh, individual. So what are some of the microbes to watch out for in the context of the toxic exposure? Uh, these, are sort, these are some of the um, uh, 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 pathogens that I'll, I'll assess for. Mycoplasma, uh, Lyme, as well as, as, well as co-infections, Bartonella, Bavisa, Ehrlichia, Anaplasma, Rocky Mountain Spotted Fever. And make no mistake, and certainly the CDC is coming around, while we believe that tick-borne illnesses um, are, are thought to be regional in nature, the, the, the reality is I've had patients from just about every state in the country express uh, Lyme. Protomyxo, which is a parasite, uh, Epstein-Barr virus, which typically is reactivated in the setting of an impaired immune system, uh, HHV-6, there's been a lot of work on this in chronic fatigue uh, out of Stanford. Uh, cytomegalovirus, I see a little bit of, but I, I'm seeing more and more toxoplasmosis, uh, which has been specifically linked to mood disorders and bipolar disease. Uh, and it's a parasite that certainly can be transmitted vertically. It can be transmitted through cats, um, but it, it, will, uh, find it, the, it will find its way into the brain and cause uh, uh, mood-related disorders. I have a number of patients with bipolar disease and, and toxo. Um, so this is a neuroinflammatory expression of toxoplasmosis, HSV1 and 2, streptococcus, which has been associated with pandas or pans now, and then finally mold. And this is not candida. These are mold forms that typically grow in water-damaged buildings. Um, a lot of these illnesses, um, especially Lyme and some of the viral pathogens and certainly mold, they all trigger the innate immune system. That is the final common pathway. You can't tell the difference. Uh, based on symptoms alone, um, what the patient has. And sometimes they have multiple exposures occurring simultaneously. And uh, oftentimes, because of the immune dysfunction, uh, which leads to a higher acidity in the body and poor, um, poor liver and kidney function as a result, it's one of the major mechanisms by which these patients become more and more toxic overall, meaning that they tend to accumulate uh, heavy metals and chemicals. So there are many, many reasons why these two areas overlap. So what kind of inflammation am I talking about with these biotoxic exposures? It's not an elevated sed rate or CRP. It's not the acquired immune response. Uh, there is an element of Th1, Th2, but it's more so dominated by TGF beta 1, which can trigger Th17. So there is a bridge into the acquired side, but it's mostly through the alternate complement pathway we usually see elevated coagulation markers. We'll see a suppression of T regular, regulatory cells, CD4, CD25. We'll see an elevation in hypoxia inducible factor. Um, and many of these occur at the same time. So we have a way of identifying. And this is a, a big data set that we collect on our patients. Um, I uh, published a base with uh, Richie Shoemaker. Uh, we have a variety of uh, disease populations where we look at exposures, biotoxins, and their sort of neuroinflammatory consequences, uh, both on the metabolic side as well as uh, the, final, um, the final consequence, which is in the brain itself, which I'll talk about. So this is a systemic problem, uh, meaning that there's no one lab, there's no one symptom that tends to encapsulate this problem. We have some labels for it clinically, chronic fatigue syndrome, fibromyalgia, atypical depression, uh, but the symptoms can actually be far more complex and even worse than that. Fatigue is a central factor in all of this. Most of these patients will report high levels of fatigue. It's also very common to have cognitive decline and executive dysfunction. Patients will typically describe brain fog, uh, poor recall and memory, uh, difficulties with word finding, uh, as well as uh, even a development of um, lack of concentration and focus, almost like an ADD or ADHD. Uh, they'll usually, but not always, complain of some sort of migratory joint uh, pain, as well as respiratory problems. The respiratory problems come from uh, elevated C4A and, and an abnormal VEGF, which means that uh, these patients are typically hypoxic. They have low VO2 and poor uh, heart rate recovery from even minimal effort. They often have uh, some pulmonary hypertension, as well as right-sided heart failure as a result. So we're getting better at identifying what are the key abnormalities in these patients that are the underlying factors for why 
there are so many symptoms that these patients will typically have. But there is this kind of final common pathway, which is the triggering of the innate immune system. Um, but differential diagnosis is key. Here is the model that uh, Dr. Shoemaker has developed in terms of, you know, what really happens with these patients as biotoxins accumulate when it's heavy metals and chemicals and mold and lime and so on and so forth. So what's going on? Um, some patients will uh, be able to deal with the um, accumulation of biotoxins very efficiently. They don't have MTHFR abnormalities. They don't have additional CBS mutations or CLMT mutations. They are not HLA sensitive. Uh, and so they can shift from innate to acquired immunity very efficiently. Uh, and they can, they can eliminate um, biological toxins such as uh, chemicals and heavy metals uh, without much trouble. But there is a, a group of patients, both by situation as well as uh, for genetic reasons, where they're susceptible. A lot of that susceptibility is through HLA sequencing, and we've begun to identify which are the uh, gene um, um, alleles that confer susceptibility for uh, a variety of biological exposures, and then which are the ones that are specific to uh, certain toxins. What we know is that um, when there is this susceptibility, we see increase in cytokine production as well as increasing in leptin. And um, what this means is that the patient is becoming more and more inflamed, but we also see as a consequence of that inflammation damage to key receptors uh, in the brain. And so in particular, uh, leptin resistance tends to develop because of damage to the leptin receptor as well as uh, changes in the brain's expression in the hypothalamus of its ability to uh, produce VIP, which is vasoactive intestinal peptide. This is a very important neuropeptide for um, brain regeneration, as well as MSH, or melanocyte-stimulating hormone. This is the main regulatory hormone for all other hormones in the body, so we often have uh, hormonal, peripheral hormonal abnormalities in the HPA axis, HPT, HPG, um, as well as, interestingly, MSH regulates tight junctions in the gut. So it's um, sort of a double whammy in terms of these patients often have hormonal imbalances as well as uh, food sensitivities and gut dysfunction. Uh, the leptin resistance in particular often leads to significant weight gain. Uh, sometimes it's 40, 50, 60 pounds in a short period of time. Uh, and then we also see changes in ABP. And ABP uh, helps to regulate blood volume and electrolyte status in the body, so patients will often describe electric-like shocks, muscle twitches, eye twitching, for example, muscle vibrations, as well as orthostasis and um, um, neurally mediated hypotension. So the brain-related impact of this inflammation uh, can't be understated. And when you look at the wide um, activity of MSH in the body, it becomes clear why a lower MSH will lead to all sorts of symptomatic abnormalities. As I mentioned, there's a disruption in the circadian uh, rhythm. We see chronic pain. Uh, patients um, have been noted to have um, uh, underexpression of en uh, endorphins as a result, which can lead to chronic pain. Uh, the gastrointestinal problems, I've been um, not only surprised, but even enlightened in the setting of patients where they have ongoing gut problems, uh, they can't tolerate food, they're very sensitive, dysbiotic, bloated, um, and we try everything we, we, we know how to do in terms of glutamine and arabinogalactans and colostrum and IgG and cat's claw and, you know, so on and so forth, all the usual actors and nothing, nothing gets better, and it's because this actually is centrally mediated. Uh, so here, here again, this is a gut-brain issue. Um, we also see dysregulation of white blood cells in response to the cytokine outpouring. Uh, so these patients are um, um, susceptible to chronic infections in general. Again, changes in the HPA axis. Uh, I've mentioned over and over and over uh, the, the role of the brain uh, in stress and uh, neuroinflammation in all of its forms, including innate immune activation, uh, absolutely changes the body's responsivity to uh, stressors. Again, we see changes in androgens, and we see an accumulation of, of other infections like coagulative staph in the deep nasal passages. Um, just as importantly, uh, we can capture increased cytokine production, um, which will lead to increase in hypoxia-inducible factor, um, which stimulates uh, VEGF and TGF theta one which you can see in the upper right-hand corner. These are basically transcription factors which regulate not only the immune system, but also capillary blood flow. 
and so these patients tend to be um, uh, quite hypoxic and have poor exercise tolerance as a result. TGF beta one has also been linked to TGH seventeen. So here is the bridge to autoimmune diseases, uh, and TGF beta one will suppress T reg cells. So we'll see lower uh, CD four CD twenty eight. Um, so all of this will lead to immune system dysfunction, uh, which um, has also uh, an expression in terms of overproduction of split products of complement activation. So markers of uh, C4A and C3A, um, C4A tends to climb in any sort of biological exposure, um, and C3A will typically only climb in the setting of a profound bacterial exposure. So if you have a high C4A but not C3A, I begin thinking toxins, I begin thinking mold, um, I, I don't think Lyme or, or other co-infections uh, when, I, when I see a normal C3A. Uh, and so um, all of this also can lead to problems in MMP9, which is matrix metalloproteinase, uh, which begins to break down the connective tissue elevations in Pi-1 and IL-1 beta. Uh, so um, we'll see uh, increase in uh, uh, anticardiolipin antibodies, D-dimer, uh, these patients, as you can imagine, are a mess. They're a mess from the brain on down in terms of uh, not only their central nervous system, but their inflammatory changes, their hormonal imbalances, their gut dysfunction. Uh, and it's a system that's just kind of unraveling. They will be very, very, very sick, but most of your standard markers, most of your autoimmune uh, markers, and just about all of your normal functional medicine markers uh, will, will not yield any abnormality. So you have to start looking at the innate immune system and the complexity of this expression. But this is really where the money is for those patients that have that sort of um, mixture of central nervous system issues in addition to um, hormonal imbalances, weight gain, fatigue, cognitive decline, so on and so forth. So what, um, what are some of these exposures? It's mold, it's dinoflagellates, it's Lyme. Cyanobacteria, it's Babesia. Uh, I see a lot of this in my practice. You probably do too. Uh, you probably are labeling this adrenal fatigue or leaky gut or chronic fatigue or fibromyalgia. You may have gotten a food panel or you know nutrient uh, nutrient panel, and there will be some abnormalities there. But not until you go deeper. Not until you look at the sort of model of triad two and four the gut immune brain, liver, lymph, kidney complex, will you really begin to understand uh, what's going on with these patients? We've done symptom cluster analysis. We know patients can't tell what they've been exposed to, but we know the pattern of symptoms. Uh, it's a long list, but when you get used to this list, you'll realize that these patients keep repeating themselves one after the next. And so uh, when you're attuned to these symptom clusters, you'll um, uh, really begin to become suspicious of exposures and, and sort of all of its forms. Um, so one of the consequences of all of this inflammation uh, and a degradation of the individual's terrain is that there's a great impact on the brain. I mentioned this uh, um, in uh, several slides in the past, but um, what we've done then is begun to overlay a uh, measured response with regard to a volumetric assessment of 11 key areas of the brain. And this is called NeuroQuant, and uh, this is an algorithm that was originally designed for uh, Alzheimer's and Parkinson's, looking at the substantia nigra and the basal ganglia. We have repurposed it um, um, in the context of these patients that are very, very ill, that fit the symptom criteria, as well as the serum criteria, and we've had some pretty extraordinary results with regard to the specific brain-related changes uh, that occur in key centers. And the, the brain tissue is just like any other tissue in the body. Certain areas swell and uh, other areas shrink. So what we're looking for is change in volume. And this occurs because of interstitial edema as well as uh, atrophy or, or pruning, basically dendritic retraction. I've talked about this in the context of stress. This is in part how I measure and verify uh, chronic stress in my patients because we see a small hippocampus. Uh, but we also see other alterations in um, key brain centers when they have various exposures. We now know basically what a brain looks like when a patient has had chronic Lyme disease. We also know uh, what a brain looks like when a patient has been living in a uh, moldy environment. Uh, we know what traumatic brain injury is. We know what chronic stress is, um, so on and so forth. So the, the, the volumetric um, analysis has been incredibly helpful to verify what's going on clinically as well as uh, in the serum. Uh, 
And so we know that there's a genetic component to this. We just don't know why, for example, if there's sort of the final common pathway of innate immune activation, why are there differential brain-related changes? And we're looking to mRNA in particular um, with these patients. So part of this process of brain inflammation um, has to do with microglial cells that become activated. Uh, they release their neurotoxic factors, and they begin to singe and uh, um, kill, essentially, uh, uh, local neurons. So we see dendritic retraction as a result, loss of pruning, uh, and volume loss. Uh, as, as a result. And so the mechanism is pretty clear now what's going on in key centers. Uh, so this atrophy or loss of neuronal tissue uh, is permanent unless it's uh, just dendritic pruning. Uh, and we, we know that uh, in some patients who've had overwhelming stress, it's atrophy. In other patients, it's dendritic pruning. In the biotoxic population, it's more dendritic pruning, sort of dendrites retracting into themselves to protect themselves from the neuroexcitation and, and inflammation. Um, but again, we often only know after we do a therapeutic trial. Uh, so we have some key interventions that we do with these patients after we detoxify them, decrease their inflammation, kill their bugs, get them out of the moldy home, uh, and then we begin working on repairing their brain damage. Um, but sometimes we're successful and sometimes we're not. So this is a typical MRI slice. This is a, uh, um, a segmented view when we begin to stain. Uh, key centers. This is what the volumetric assessment looks like, uh, and this is what a report is. Um, and you can see on the right-hand column uh, the asymmetry index by percent. And these are the numbers that we look at in grade based on the degree of uh, volume gain or loss, and we compare these to norms. And so we know what these numbers should be. We know when they're too big or too small. And uh, this has been a really important feature of, of these patients. Um, we also know that this is unique to innate immune activation, that uh, there is no other uh, inflammatory process or neurologic disease that leads to these very specific changes, and this is some of the data that, that we've collected. Um, so what do we see in patients that have had water damage building? So there are five areas that are not seen in any other illness. We see elevations in size of forebrain parenchyma and cortical gray matter. We see an increase in the hippocampus sometimes. Uh, we'll almost always see a decrease in the caudate, and right next to it is the pallidum, uh, which is increased. The cerebellum can be enlarged, so we'll actually see increased size in the ventricles as a result because the CFF can't flow out of the brain, and the thalamus and putamen are, are normal. Um, that is not true for Lyme. So, in fact, we'll see a small putamen in, the, uh, in Lyme and an enlarged thalamus and uh, cerebellum, but normal cortical gray matter, hippocampus, and, and caudate. And sometimes you get a mixed picture. Sometimes it's, it's Lyme and mold. Sometimes it's something else, what we call multi, multi-nuclear uh, atrophy. So again, no other combination that we've seen in this regard. We know that it's due to a breakdown of blood-brain barrier because of the inflammatory response that's occurring in these patients. Um, and so, um, so this is one side of the coin. Uh, when you see someone who is uh, this sick with fatigue, cognitive decline, neuropathies, gut dysfunction. You start thinking toxicity, but it's both on the sort of uh, biotoxic side, meaning uh, organism, as well as the toxin side. So I wanted to talk about that a little bit too. It's interesting when you um, uh, begin searching the literature on, on medical toxicology and chronic exposures, it turns out more recently, again, beginning basically 2007, 2008, um, the tone is, of conversation has changed, and, and that is to say that um, uh, we're beginning to see white papers being produced out of the White House, such as um, looking at the role of environmental chemicals inducing immune disease, such as cancer, uh, and I think we're all beginning to accept the fact that as we accumulate uh, chemical exposures, we see further either neurologic disease or immunologic disease. Uh, uh, chemicals in particular, there's about 80,000 of them in the environment. Uh, uh, they're often classified as persistent organic pollutants, or organophosphates, uh, PCBs, phthalates, dioxins. Uh, these can be relatively easily measured in the urine, but they have an enormous impact on nervous tissue as well as immune function and endocrine function. Um, in the same way that biotoxins can create leptin resistance, and lead to significant weight gain, so too can uh, persistent organic pollutants often induce insulin resistance uh, at the insulin receptor level. And so these patients are at risk for uh, diabetes. 
So there's, again, an overlap in these, these categories that are really important. I also just pulled uh, this article. Um, I've, I've been following the work of Dr. Grand Jean out of Harvard uh, School of Public Health. Uh, they've done some phenomenal work looking at the role of toxicity in the developing brain and showing that uh, when the mother is exposed to uh, a variety of heavy metals and chemicals, this is uh, seemed to correlating. This seems to be correlated with um, neurodevelopmental um, challenges in children, whether it's ADD or autistic uh, disease or autism spectrum disorder. So um, we know that they're they're getting into the nervous system. They are neurotoxicants, and the brain, of course, becomes the final common pathway. It is a mess from a clinical perspective when you have a patient that has high levels of lead and cadmium, as well as plastics, and they've had a mold exposure. Uh, the um, the brain-related changes are accelerated, they're complicated, and they're very, very hard to treat. We also know that there's sort of this um, uh, priming event that occurs when children have these sorts of exposures, and um, it can set the sort of tone for uh, how the immune system and nervous system behaves for their whole lives. Uh, this is also true for chemicals. We know that when children are exposed to pesticides and herbicides in youth, it creates a significant increased risk for diabetes later in life. So sometimes these things develop uh, in early stages and sometimes they, uh, the problems arise late stage. Um, my concern is when you have these sort of multiple hits of a traumatic emotional event, exposures to chemicals and heavy metals, as well as a biotoxic event, uh, and, you know, again, the final common pathway, which is um, uh, uh, brain atrophy or, or pruning, um, and so these patients can be very, very sick because of the complexity of their sort of immunologic, neurologic, endocrinologic um, imbalances. So how do these patients present with this sort of multi-layer problem, uh, muscle aches, fatigue, fibromyalgia, food sensitivities, and chemicals? Uh, here's a short list of effects of toxic metals. I'll go over this in much greater detail at the conference in October itself. Uh, but we know they persist, they accumulate, they disrupt uh, enzyme substrates, they impair the immune system, they can lead to bacterial overgrowth, they nurture um, pathogens in a sense, and pathogens harbor them. Uh, there is this bi-directional relationship. So it's the reason why I added in this sort of um, treatment of innate immune activation leading to neuroinflammation and brain changes, uh, because the toxic metals just make all of that worse. Uh, so why patients become toxic? We know that there's genetic reasons for this. I know um, some of you are really interested in 23andMe and MTHFR and CBS and CMT, but there's also HLA sequencing, which is a little different, um, as well as sort of just the general exposure to heavy metals, uh, whether it's vertical transmission from, uh, transmission from the mother, as well as what happens to the person uh, over the course of their life. And again, infectious agents also tell the body to basically hold on to toxins. So um, getting rid of biological exposures and dealing with toxins, again, go hand in hand. So we have this sort of accumulated gut immune brain pathology where patients will have all sorts of gut complaints as well as immune dysfunction, which ultimately can lead to autoimmune disease, but that's not where they start. And then the cognitive and mood-related changes can be relatively profound. I've seen patients with schizophrenia, uh, bipolar, uh, seizure disorder, and it's because of this kind of disruption of gut immune brain. Here is a variety of markers that I draw in my patients with gut immune brain abnormalities when I'm thinking about biological toxins. Um, in this particular triad, I've uh, labeled out uh, some of the innate immune markers, including the MMP9, C3A, C4A, TGF beta 1, uh, T reg cells, meaning CD4, CD25, as well as the um, uh, hypercoagulability states. And then in the brain, we have the neuropeptides of VIP and MSH, as well as the um, applicability now of volumetric brain scans and visual contrast study. Uh, we can measure beta-2 microglobulin, which gives us some indication of blend brain barrier integrity. There are other markers for that as well. In addition to changes in methylation cycle, which predisposes to both mood-related changes as well as toxic accumulation and, of course, immune dysfunction. Um, so we have a lot of tools now uh, that begin to overlay in this regard. Um, here is a list of a lot of the products that I use, but not all, in terms of beginning to regulate gut immune brain, um, which I'll talk about uh, at the uh, conference. Uh, and then the fourth triad, liver, lymph, kidney, uh, 
uh, which is about drainage. And so you really can't talk about gut immune brain pathology in the setting of a need immune activation without uh, what I talk about draining the swamp. And that is to say, you got to get rid of the toxins at the same time that you deal with the biological exposures. They, again, absolutely go hand in hand. The sort of triad two, triad four link is extraordinary in um, how important that is. And, and, and it really provides a path for getting these people better. So um, liver, lymph, kidney is about um, uh, metabolic processing and removal of toxins. And when it's normal, we have a smooth flow of substrates in and out of the body. Uh, but when it's in balance, people tend to have inflammation, stagnation, and retention. Um, it's very important for sort of equanimity in the world, uh, having a metabolic reserve to deal with exposures. And when they fill up, they lose that metabolic uh, regulation. And so they have a disruption. And yes, uh, a liver, lymph, kidney, but also intrinsically in gut immune brain too. Um, here is a list of liver, lymph, kidney supplements um, in terms of how do I go about uh, removing toxins. Again, I'll talk about this uh, in, um, in the upcoming uh, module in greater detail, and I'll go through protocols of how do you safely detoxify patients. I know that some of you get a little nervous in that regard, but um, it's actually relatively straightforward uh, when you know how to do it safely. And again, whenever I'm dealing with a Lyme patient or a mold patient or even a stress patient, I always reach for triad for liver, lymph, kidney, uh, because you have to detoxify these people. Usually you'll find their pH levels are quite low, so they're becoming acidic. I have my patients all checking their pH. Uh, they need to be 6.8 or above. If their pH is too low, and there's all sorts of data recently showing the kidneys cannot liberate and release heavy metals and chemicals, you got to raise their pH, you have to remineralize them, you have to get them on a better diet, you have to reduce their stress. Uh, pH is key, uh, even probably more so than what their SNPs are in terms of MTHFR and so on and so forth. Uh, if you can sedate the system and get them more alkaline, they will begin to liberate toxins. Uh, and so here are some of the tools that I use in that regard. So I know that was a lot. I, it was sort of a whirlwind tour. This is kind of the coming attractions of uh, the toxicology module. I hope I piqued your interest because I think this is an extraordinarily important topic. And I have come to the realization myself that I can't really talk about medical toxicology without broadening that discussion to biological exposures. And so we're automatically getting into that sort of immune dysfunction and neuroinflammation that is sort of part and parcel to um, uh, toxins. So um, I wanted to frame all that up for you, show you how deep and interesting this world can be uh, in that regard for uh, toxicology and how I look at it in my practice. And uh, thank you for staying on with me, uh, and I'll be happy to answer any questions that you might have. Wonderful. Um, if anyone has any questions, again, please use your chat button. Uh, but I also wanted to thank you all so much for joining us this evening. Um, please do join us for Module 6. It will be in Chicago on October 8th through the 10th uh, for Module Number 6, which is a metabolic and functional approach to toxicology and detoxification. Uh, this module will cover symptoms, disorders, and diseases associated with exposures of heavy, heavy metals, pesticides, chemicals, drugs, nutrients, and natural environment and other toxic causes of oxidative stress. Um, you will meet faculty members Dr. Andrew Heyman, uh, Dr. James Lavelle, uh, Dr. Pamela Smith, Dr. Russell Jaffe, uh, Dr. Cheryl Burdett, and many more. Um, so please do call your education advisor, 561-910-4960. Um, Dr. Heyman, I don't see any questions coming through at this time. However, if anyone does have any questions, please um, use the, the email function and we would be more than happy to answer your questions. And just as I said that we do have one question coming in. Um, can you put the, sorry, can you put the gut brain immune triad supplement slide up again? <clears throat> Um, with all the multiple symptoms, where do you start? <laughs> well, well, we'll go over that. <laughs> There's a real ordered uh, process to how you deal with these patients. And so uh, what we've learned is that um, uh, there are specific steps that you have to take uh, to get them better. And um, so this is a general list. Um, but I, I can, in greater detail, go over uh, what those steps are. But, but by and large, uh, 
uh, you have to start with uh, removing the exposure and beginning to uh, deal with detox. Uh, but I usually use homeopathic remedies on the detox side uh, to initiate because these patients are typically sick. And then I'll also give some support to the gut. Um, and I'll be using, uh, I often use uh, toxin binders. So I'll be binding toxins in the gut. And that's not even on this list. Um, so I'll be using things like cholestyramine, charcoal, chlorella, uh, even plant sterols, uh, which are all very good at um, uh, uh, grabbing onto the sort of uh, toxic overload that these patients tend to accumulate. Uh, so I start with the gut in that regard, um, and we, we, we go from there. It's, it's really a, a complicated um, answer, and, and it's a great question. We just don't have time tonight to um, go over all of it in detail. Um, but we, but, but by and large, what we do is we actually kind of start with the gut, and then we immediately get into dealing with the immune system and turning off immune inflammation, and we have specific ways of doing that. And we reserve dealing with the brain-related changes until the very end. Uh, we know now that if the patient is still inflamed and still exposed, um, we're not very successful at repairing the damage or reversing the pruning. Uh, so that's sort of a, a model, um, generally speaking. I'm sorry, I can't be more specific, but um, um, but that's that's my general approach. Great. And the last question is with regards to um, amalgams. Will you be addressing uh, mercury detoxification? We will be addressing mercury detoxification. Yes, we will. Okay, wonderful. Well, thank you so much to everyone, especially you, Dr. Heyman. We always appreciate your expertise. Uh, we look forward to seeing everyone in Chicago. Everyone have a pleasant evening. Great. Thanks, Lindsay. Thank you. Thanks, everyone.